I'm Stephen Foskett, the organizer of Tech Field Day, and the video you're about to watch is a Tech Field Day presentation from November of 2016. We have uh, invited a panel of independent writers and speakers from across the internet and around the world to join us here in Silicon Valley to meet with various companies, discuss their products, and learn about their technologies. Uh, right now, you're going to learn about Igneous Systems. Uh, you can find out more about them. Uh, you can find them on Twitter, Igneous.io. You can go to Igneous.io. And if you'd like to learn more about this event, just go to techfieldday.com or view more videos like this at youtube.com slash techfieldday. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Kiran Bageshpur. I am the co-founder and CEO at Igneous Systems. Uh, I'm here with my colleagues that I will introduce towards the end of my session here. But what I want to do is take a little time to frame what it is that we do, tell you a little bit about the company and the problems that we solve, and give you a peek into some of the use cases and customers that we are working with. Uh, <clears throat> so we are based in Seattle, uh, Washington, cloud capital of the world. We got started about three years ago in fall of 2013, and we have raised uh, a chunk of change from a variety of uh, venture investors, NEA and Redpoint, from here in Silicon Valley and Madrona Venture Group in, uh, in Seattle. Now, the team we have put together in the last three years is an interesting sort of combination of two very separate uh, groups of people. One, folks with lots of experience building on-premise infrastructure, the EMC, the Isilon, the NetApps of the world. And to that team, we have added folks with lots of experience working on cloud-native architectures, working with sort of cloud-scale uh, infrastructure. This is the AWS, uh, Microsoft Azure, as well as Google Cloud, all of whom we have recruited and brought together. Now, as we go through this presentation, hopefully you will see as to why it makes sense for us to have brought these two groups of folks together. Now, I'm going to walk you through the exact sort of pro the offering as well as our um, sort of uh, commercial model. But in the meantime, indulge me, because I believe that the best way to go uh, articulate what we do is take you through a couple of customer examples. <clears throat> so these are real customer use cases, real customers that we have. Needless to say, I'm not disclosing the names, but um, uh, they require confidentiality. So if you consider today, vehicles are a source of data, and they are a source of high fidelity data that is actually very valuable to the vehicle manufacturer. This is used to help them make the driving experience better, make the, car, make the vehicle a better vehicle. The challenge that uh, exists with this sort of a data is that A, it's large and growing, and there are some sort of uh, physical challenges with moving this to a public cloud infrastructure. And yet, both the data as well as the workflows around that have a level of proprietary nature to it. Another example would be a financial services company. Again, a company which works with a lot of data. In this case, it would be the movement of every single stock symbol in every market in the world over for all times. And this is the sort of data that they keep forever, continuously process and reprocess, and run their proprietary trading algorithms against that. Same pattern here again. Uh, <clears throat> lots of data, continuously growing, kind of challenging to go move it off-premise to the public cloud. And even if they could, there's a level of sensitivity with regards to the type of information and the type of workflows and computation that they do against it. So this is two examples. But as we talked to a whole bunch of customers through the last three years in our history, we came across this as a continuous pattern, which is, number one, data is growing. We all know that. But what's driving that more so than ever now is actually machine-generated data. Good example would be, if you look at the media world in 10 years, you've gone from SD to, to sort of essentially VR content. And that's represented at each stage a pretty substantial increase in the sort of volume of data being generated. Uh, also true as an example in the bio IT world. It's not just about genome sequencing, but it's also around next generation microscopy, which actually all of these tend to be essentially image data. The other common thing we saw with all of these customers is this data is valuable. This is what is the core of their business. In fact, we came across this uh, phrase about data being the new oil. And customers and organizations keep this for a long period of time, 
uh, continuously reprocess it. And everyone's building what we call a 21st century data pipeline, ways to continuously ingest this data to automatically decorate it with additional information which are available at that point in time, curating it over time, processing it and reprocessing, and of course, storing it for a long period of time. Um, a pattern we saw over and over again that we refer to sort of, sort of as data-centric computing. This is the case where customers care about the information, it is core to their business, uh, and they are continuously operating with it. <clears throat> what I'd like to do is take this sort of notion of data-centric computing up a level and bring it together with sort of cloud, if you will. <clears throat> if you consider, we, like, we love to go look at everything on an X and Y axis, and of course, no points off for guessing that we will end up in the top right. Um, but I'd like to go chat about a, a couple of ways. One of them is you know, cloud versus not cloud. I will talk about what we think of as characteristics of the cloud, depending on what customers have told us. But let's start with the story, if you will. For the longest time, all infrastructure was on-premises. Uh, it was local to applications. It was uh, within a customer's uh, network. It was uh, easily accessible by local users and machines. But the problem was these were effectively difficult to operate, difficult to scale, uh, and certainly treated as silo systems one at a time. Um, in sort of reaction, I'd almost say to this, we've had in the last decade or so what you would call as the public cloud. And when we talked to customers and said, what is it that they really like about the public cloud? A few things came about very clearly. Number one, with the public cloud, people are not buying hardware infrastructure. They're not licensing software. They are not installing this licensed software on the said hardware. They're not monitoring and managing uh, infrastructure. They are consuming instead infrastructure across an API. Uh, and not only that, they have access to this whole new way of dealing with infrastructure, which is very different than what's been available even a decade ago. Last but not the least, least, all of this is consumed sort of in a subscription model, if you will, where customers are paying for this as they consume it, as opposed to paying for it with large capital purchases up front. Uh, so that's what the real public cloud is. That's what we think of as true cloud. And it's been remarkably successful, a huge disruption in the last decade or so. Um, reaction to that, and I would say this is almost a reaction to that, what came about was the private cloud, if you will. And we tend to think of the private cloud as not quite truly the characteristics of the cloud. As in, customers tell us they are still buying hardware infrastructure, they're still licensing software, they're still monitoring and managing infrastructure, and while there has certainly been an improvement in the efficiency with regards to provisioning and some level of automation, that whole rich set of uh, distributed APIs and API-driven infrastructure is missing from this world. And that's the gap we look to go fill, which is how do you deliver the true cloud experience to uh, workloads that live within a customer's data center for workloads that can't or will not move to the public cloud? Okay, so how do we do this? That's kind of what the goal is. It's cloud services, it's on-premises, it's a focus on data-centric computing, and I'll talk about how we do this. <clears throat> so it's delivered via appliances. These are appliances that we have built. We deploy them within the customer's data center. It's behind their firewalls, as such accessible to their users and their applications at land speed rather than internet speeds. Uh, but it's fully managed in every way by software running in our cloud, if you will. Uh, we manage, we operate the infrastructure, and the customers pay for this stuff in a subscription, with, as a subscription service, paying an annual subscription depending upon the amount of infrastructure installed. <clears throat> we refer to this really as zero-touch infrastructure because as we go through this presentation, you will, we will walk you through how we have designed both the appliance as well as the software stack to ensure that neither we nor our customers really have to touch this infrastructure. Uh, and that was really driven, as far as we were concerned, by experiences that we have had in the past, which is any time human beings have to go touch infrastructure, that's both cumbersome, it's expensive, and it's error-prone. 
Uh, the infrastructure is, again, completely API-driven. Um, and just like Amazon started this whole journey 10 years ago with storage, simple storage service S3, the very first service we are offering is um, a igneous data service that is accessible across an S3 API. Uh, what's in the data center? Questions so far? All right, let me go to the last one, which is the sort of pricing and availability. We are, as I said, the very first service that we are here talking about today is the Igneous Data Service. It's a content store for large unstructured data offered as a pay-as-you-go service. Uh, it's zero touch, as in uh, certainly our customers do not have to touch, manage in any way the infrastructure. We'll talk about how we do that. It's available today. We have customers in deployment, even though we've just launched and come out of stealth less, about a month ago or so. Um, and the pricing is <coughs> very compelling, at least that's what our customers tell us. It's less than $40,000 per year for the initial uh, install, the minimum install, which is 212 terabytes usable. Uh, and the way we look at this is it's incredibly attractive and compares very well against on-premise traditional infrastructure and compares well, very well with the public cloud infrastructure. So that's how it is. It's true cloud for local data. It lives inside a customer's network and behind their firewall, and yet customers don't own the appliance. They do not manage infrastructure. They consume it across API. They have access to, infra to have services, which is in a sort of cloud-native uh, APIs. Um, all the benefits of the cloud, but yet within the enterprise data center. Yes. Cool. Okay, so you have to buy 212. So you're paying 212 with the one and a half cents per gig, even uh, if you don't use it. Correct. Okay. So how... Oh. Go ahead. So how do you provide, or what kind of uh, SLAs do you provide around either availability of the platform on-prem, um, around uh, replacement of failed hardware, that kind of thing? Right. Uh, Great question. The answer is, again, as I said, zero-touch infrastructure. We take care of all uh, maintenance of the infrastructure. As we, I ask you, ask your indulgence to wait as we go through the presentation because you will see how we do things such that it's not required to really go and replace hardware or replace failed components the way it's, in, in, it's important in traditional infrastructure. Uh, to answer your question, which is, Yes, it's uh, 212 terabytes usable is the minimum buy. It's a single 4U sort of chassis, if you will. Uh, and what, with the workflows and customers we are talking with, that is a very nice starting point because typically we are targeting large and growing data sets. Um, and customers tell us that's a more granular starting point than any competition. It'd be, it'd be also just good to understand as you get to that piece. Um, what kind of minimum requirements you would expect from a customer data center to be able to be consider that as a viable place to put your infrastructure? Uh, we've typically gone into all of our customers today have uh, sort of traditional enterprise data centers, either the ones that they operate themselves or the ones that they are, that's a regular colo facility. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what the requirement is. Uh, we've certainly run into work, workflows and use cases where it could literally go into a closet but that's not quite what's happened right now. It's a traditional data center. Looked at doing things like um, even coloing with people like Equinix and having a kind of almost a as a service deal that a customer could. Uh, link. That is certainly a possibility. We do not uh, necessarily rule that out. We've certainly had conversations with such partners, but to begin with, our focus is in customers who have this sort of growing data sets that they actually actively work with.